Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. So my name is Ori Rothstein. I'm uh, the chief of surgery here at St. Michael's Hospital, which is across the road. But I'm also the director of the Research Institute, which is where you are now. And uh, I want to, I know that there are some people, uh, most of the teachers actually have been to some of these lectures before. Uh, any students been here before? Okay, so why don't we uh, introduce the school. So I know at the front we have Riverdale. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so who's, who's here from your school? He's loved and ladies here. Okay, so uh, how many of them? Six. Okay, good, good. And so uh, Upper Canada? Sorry, Reed Jeffrey from Upper Canada College, and I have four uh, grade 10 students with me. Okay, fantastic. Who else do we have? Uh, okay, and um, uh, St. Michael Squire, so right next door. Um, we have five grade 10 boys and a grade 11 boy who's going to be presenting at some point. Okay, fantastic. And, and Ross Murray, we're here from Miami Collegiate. We have six students in grade 11. Okay, so fantastic. So welcome to everybody. Um, so uh, this is what we call the Keenan Popular Science Lecture Series. Um, this uh, lecture series is probably about three years old now, and um, one of the objectives that we have in this lecture series is actually to uh, bring our best scientists here at St. Michael's Hospital to hear and to speak with you and to meet with you and uh, really just hear their story and, and hear their really interesting story of how they you know, basically do their very basic research and how it has implications for uh, patients. And we're really very well positioned to do that because we have the Research Institute here, we have the hospital across the road, and we have our community here as well. So the idea is that we can take very fundamental research in biology uh, or other types of things that you'll hear from Cameron today, uh, take it into the hospital, uh, take it into the community, and to, as you'll hear today, uh, really take it into the global community, which is really interesting. And so um, we, uh, we actually have kind of a special treat today. This is uh, Dr. Cameron Kahn. He's an associate professor of medicine at the University of Toronto. He specializes in infectious disease. And what, what makes his talk today uh, interesting and a little different is number one, he's a fabulous speaker. Um, but also, uh, up till now in a lot of the talks, we've talked about very fundamental biology, how molecules can be understood a little bit better and then taken from that to uh, develop drugs or other interventions and into patients. And we call that translational research, but actually, when you think of it, if you're going to patients, you have to sometimes translate an awful long way. And uh, that's what you hear Cameron talk about today. Uh, basically, he's gonna talk about how his work here at the uh, Lee Keshing Knowledge Institute actually translates into an effect on the, the global community. So it's a little bit different. Um, because we've been talking about molecules a lot before, but this is going to be, you know, talking about translational, can, translational globally. I, I think the other thing that he's going to talk a little bit about at the end of his talk uh, has to do with this issue of um, how do you make a discovery, how do you develop intellectual property and patents around that discovery, and how you can take that discovery and make it into a company and use that company to raise funds, to sustain, your idea to scale up your idea to make it way bigger than it was when it started. And I, I think if you if you read the newspapers at all, that's that's kind of a hot thing. Like how can you take fundamental discovery here in Canada and how can we propagate that into uh, having protected intellectual property like patents and then uh, move develop a company and move it uh, broadly. So um, uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. I won't be able to stay for the entire talk, but uh, I, I've heard Cameron talk before, and I think you're really in for a treat. There's lots of food at the back, but you're going to be so enamored with this talk, you won't want any more food. So, uh, Cameron, without further ado, Corey, thank you very much, thank you. and uh, thanks everyone for uh, for coming to this uh, this talk today. Um, you know, I think I'm going to start out uh, with um, you know, Ori was just talking a little bit about applied research and how it can have implications either direct patient care or policy decisions. I mean, one of the reasons I was actually just late, and I suspect if you guys are reading the news or if you decide to Google the virus called Zika, Z-I-K-A, you will see this in the news. In fact, I was just on with the media and the NIH and the U.S. government having discussions about this, and I'll talk a little bit about it, but it's a brand, I shouldn't say a brand new, it's a virus originally found in, in Africa uh, discovered in the Zika forest in Uganda in the 1940s, uh, has really not really done a whole lot for decades. And then just 
uh, as of May of this year, was first found in Brazil, started to locally circulate in Brazil. This is a, a, a virus that's spread by mosquitoes. There's a particular type of mosquito is called the Aedes mosquito, or Aedes aegypti is the, the main species. Uh, Aedes mosquitoes are present widely throughout Brazil and widely throughout parts of Central and South America and the Caribbean, as far north even as the United States. And the reason that this virus has started to become, uh, you know, is, is brought to everyone's attention is in a short period of time, from May until now, we have seen probably over a million cases, it's estimated a million to a million and a half cases in the area of Brazil. This virus, which um, has now spread to 14 other countries in the region, is sort of making its way northward, uh, is as far as Puerto Rico. Now, it's actually a fairly mild virus. Uh, most people don't have any symptoms. 20% of people will have, you know, fever and maybe a rash and some aches and pains. But what has been found just as of yesterday, there's more and more compelling evidence that um, this can cause very serious birth defects in newborns. Um, in Brazil, there's been a 20-fold increase in um, underdeveloped brains, a condition called microcephaly in newborns. So they had, on average, about 150 cases reported a year. There's over 3,500 reported now. And just as of yesterday, the CDC has identified Zika virus in the brains of some of the newborns that died, and the placentas as well. So there seems to be a very strong association now. So you will likely be hearing in the days, maybe even tonight and beyond, you'll probably be hearing quite a bit more about Zika virus. It also turns out we have a paper in The Lancet that is coming out today. Um, so, uh, so I'm sort of juggling a few things um, uh, with, uh, with uh, the media and so forth today. But maybe what I'll do is I'll sort of shift gears and talk a little bit about the bigger challenge. Um, since many of you are uh, early in your uh, education and thinking about what you want to do, you know, one of the things I never anticipated when I was thinking about going to pursue a career in medicine, which actually wasn't in high school, I was actually studying music and arts. I went to Tobacco School of the Arts and, and then decided somehow I wanted to go into, into science. I never envisioned that a physician might have so many different roles. And I always thought of a physician as having a pretty traditional role, seeing patients and so on. Uh, here, as you can see on this first slide, I really kind of hold uh, three different types of jobs. In one hand, I'm a practicing physician. Um, I actually have my pager on because I'm covering like 30 or 40 patients in the hospital now. Uh, I'm an associate professor, so I'm conducting research as a scientist to try and see if we can create new knowledge um, and distribute that new knowledge to help make smarter decisions. And then as Ori mentioned, um, a couple of years ago, I started thinking about um, how is it that we can scale our work? You know, academia has a certain role, um, but sometimes it's hard to actually grow that idea, to get it to be much bigger and to have a broader impact. So I founded something called Blue Dot, a social enterprise, and a social enterprise basically is a, a type of company that is created where it tries to use the forces of business as a vehicle to address social challenges and problems. So this is really an extension of the ideas coming out of my academic research program. Then the question is, how can we take those ideas and actually turn them into practical tools that people can use to make the world a healthier and safer place? And that's essentially the three roles that I have, clinician, scientist, and, and entrepreneur. So let me just tell you a little bit about uh, what we've been experiencing in the last uh, uh, you know, 15 years or so. We've had an unprecedented 15 years in history with infectious disease outbreaks. Everyone has probably just heard about the Ebola outbreak, you know, and, and it's now thankfully winding down. But if we look back to 1999, I'm trying to think how old everyone here is and how old they would have been in 1999, but uh, probably not that old. Um, but West Nile virus, this is something that you probably heard quite a bit about, it didn't exist here before 1999. So it arrived in New York City when I was doing my training in New York, and there were these cases of mysterious uh, paralysis and paralytic syndromes in people in Queens in the north end of, of New York. Um, we had SARS. I moved back to Toronto in 2003. We had the SARS epidemic. And I think that was a really eye-opening experience for me to see how an entire city could be crippled by a virus over many months. Um, and subsequently, we've had a pandemic in 2009 with the H1N1 pandemic. This is an image here of um, a picture of a wedding taken in Korea. 
just shows you how much disruption and social disruption these types of events can have. Uh, this is when there was an outbreak of MERS, or Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, in South Korea. You might remember this was not that long ago. But MERS originated in the Middle East, as far as we know, first identified in Jordan back in 2012, most of the cases in Saudi Arabia. But this really highlights how this disease, which is spread from person to person, could cause so much disruption. And you see it having this kind of social impact where people are here at a wedding, uh, but everyone is basically wearing a mask to minimize the, the potential spread of this disease. So that's uh, recent. This is an image here in West Africa. Uh, and, and I think you've all heard about the Ebola epidemic and the implications of, of just how significant this event was. And this is an image of one of the newborns with microcephaly, um, which is what is causing so much concern in, um, in not only Brazil, but now recognition that this actually is likely, very likely, uh, this was part of our research just published in The Lancet today, is very likely going to spread broadly across Central America, parts of the Caribbean, and uh, South America, um, and there's no vaccine and there's no effective treatment for it. So this has very, very big implications. One of the policy uh, suggestions from a senior health official in Brazil was that maybe women should actually not get pregnant or think about deferring pregnancy because there really isn't a whole lot of other options. This is a day-biting mosquito. Um, you know, you won't have to be extremely vigilant to avoid any mosquito bites for the duration of your pregnancy. So these have very, very significant social implications. And as I said, I think you'll be hearing more about this in, in the days to come. So unfortunately, it is kind of scary stuff in some ways, but it's also the reality that we're dealing with today. So SARS is something that highlighted the world is changing very dramatically and significantly. We have over 7 billion people in the world today. And um, it's roughly every 12 years, we add about a billion people to the world in terms of numbers. So population growth is happening at a very, very rapid rate. And as that happens, we're having more urbanization. We're actually taking down, um, you know, we're disrupting ecosystems where we may come in contact with different types of uh, infectious diseases, viruses. Ebola, for example, is found in bats um, in, you know, the parts of uh, Central uh, Africa. Uh, so urbanization, and as we encroach upon other ecosystems and environments, we can encounter some of these diseases. But we can also get animal pathogens from animals that we grow for our food uh, through livestock, bird flu and swine flu and so forth. Antimicrobial resistance is something that we see quite a bit of as a growing problem because there are more of us consuming more antibiotics and we're also feeding antibiotics to livestock that we're then consuming and so we're creating more bacteria that are resistant to these organisms. So just as my role as a clinician, 10 years ago, I almost never saw someone who was resistant to almost every medication we have. Now it is much more common. It's, I wouldn't be surprised to go and see someone who has an infection that's resistant to almost every medication or possibly every antibiotic we have available. Um, the world's climate is changing dramatically, and this is one of the interesting relationships. We often think of climate change as, uh, as an ecological issue. It's very much a health issue as well. Um, these mosquitoes that are transmitting uh, some of these infectious diseases are capable of doing so and expanding their range and geographies because climate is changing. Um, I sort of gauge the barometer of how our climate is changing based on how long I ride my bike into St. Mike's every day. So I live down in like King Spadina. And each year, it's gotten later and later. And this is the first time ever I've ridden my bike in January into the hospital. So to me, that's a little bit of a, a barometer that the world's climate is changing. And that means many of these other living systems, insects and so forth, are going to be able to survive and thrive in, in new areas. Mass gatherings, this is another important thing, is that we're social creatures. Uh, we like to gather for a variety of different things, whether it's religious events or what have you. And the scale of this is now unprecedented. We have some events where we have tens of millions of people uh, gathering in very crowded conditions. And commercial air travel, I've always been fascinated by this because it's really a game-changing piece of technology. How in the past, 100 years ago, people would have had to spend months uh, to, to get from one part of the world to another if they ever decided to undertake such a trip. Today, these are fairly simple for us to do. Uh, you know, we can get pretty much anywhere in the world in less than a day. 
So these types of infectious diseases have big impacts, big impacts to health, big impacts to security, and very big economic consequences. It cost us $2 billion to get the SARS outbreak under control here in Toronto back in 2003. So let me just describe a little bit of how we think about risk. Um, and the motivation for me to really be focusing on this area was, as an infectious disease physician and a clinician, I was always thinking, well, how am I supposed to know that there's some outbreak happening in some other region of the world? And I've probably never seen it. I might not have ever heard of it. I mean, I happen to be an infectious disease specialist, so I'm constantly looking at these things. But how many doctors may have actually ever even heard of some of these diseases? And how would they even know how to make a diagnosis of this? We used to, historically, think about the diseases that we saw in our own backyards. That was what clin you know, physicians became and healthcare providers were accustomed to. It's like, well, if I see this every day, then I know, you know, when I hear hoofs, as we say in medicine, we think horses, we don't think zebras. Um, but our, our catchment area just got a whole lot bigger. It's not just now this neighborhood, it's the whole world. And how do we know what's happening around the whole world? How can we distill all that information and make it relevant to an individual at a very specific moment at a very specific time? I mean, my job is busy enough. There's no way I could possibly be scanning all that information. So how can we use data, technology, computing, information, and how can we actually make that um, work for us to help us make smarter decisions? So when we think about risks, I often think about them in terms of monitoring, background monitoring of information around the world. I'm going to show you a little bit of what we've been doing in that space. Once we know there's an event, like Zika virus, for instance, we need to do an assessment and understand what is the risk associated with that particular event. And then, what are the appropriate interventions? How would we respond? What's the most effective way to respond? How can we respond in the most coordinated way with other countries, with other sectors, business, healthcare, industry? Uh, government and so on. And ultimately, I think one of the really exciting areas in terms of future research and development is how can we anticipate these events before they actually occur. Um, and, you know, there's some sense that perhaps maybe that crystal ball like that maybe we wouldn't really be able to do that. But there are really some exciting developments in things like machine learning, natural language processing, artificial intelligence. Um, these are types of tools that we're able to start looking at how we may be able to use these to gain insights that, I don't want to say a feeble human brain can't, but a human brain may have more creativity, but it doesn't necessarily have the capacity for the scale and magnitude of information and processing that's required. So let me just walk you through a little bit of how um, we, uh, we, we think about monitoring information. So what's happened in the last uh, 15 years or so is we started to use the internet as a medium for gathering information about infectious diseases. Um, traditionally, it was the healthcare provider. So if I saw a patient in the emergency room and I thought, oh, this person has measles, I would basically then call up the local health department, Toronto Public Health, up at you know Victoria Street, just north of here, and I would say, I have a patient who I think has measles. And then they would process that information. But sometimes it would actually take weeks or months before anyone else outside of myself and the public health lab knew that there was a case of measles. So someone in another part of the world, they would have no idea that anything was happening. So what we realized is the internet is a vast medium for sharing of information. Perhaps we can harness unstructured, informal information, whether it's through traditional media, social media, or networks of providers who talk to one another. So ProMed Mail has been up um, for about 15 years or so. Actually, no, I take it back. I think it's 20 years now. And it's an international network of how individuals, including veterinarians and healthcare providers and physicians, are all sharing information about what they're seeing locally. The Global Public Health Intelligence Network is a system and a platform developed in Ottawa by the federal government, which is mining and scanning news information 24 hours a day. And then there are about a dozen people who are translating that information to, to constantly be seeing or, or listening, if you will, to what's being discussed around the world. Um, and Health Map is another, which is more of an academic, um, uh, an academic uh, sort of news scanning program that's looking at social media and traditional media. They're based out of Harvard. We have a collaboration with them, uh, and we've had that for a number of years. So let me just show you how we then took that idea and turned it into a practical tool. So I'm just going to show a brief video. Uh, this is a web application that we built here um, at St. Mike's using again the 
the company industry arm of our work, um, to say, well, maybe our research could take us six months to do in a traditional pathway. We you know, write up our hypothesis and do all of our work and so on. Maybe it takes us six months before we get all of our research done and it's published in a journal. What we thought was we don't have six months. We need to do this in six minutes uh, or six hours. And so we wanted to start to develop tools to say, how can we generate this information very, very quickly? So I'm just going to show you how we've gathered all of this unstructured information in this surveillance module here. I'm going to just type in Zika. And it's going to now scan the world's uh, media on something related to Zika virus. And it's now going to populate, you see the circles on the map, are all of the intensity of news reports that are coming in now on Zika virus. You can see it's across much of Brazil and Central and South America. Um, because this is where the virus is actually located. And this is something that we can use. Here we're looking at the, the temporal distribution or the time distribution of, of this reporting and how often. So on November 27th, 48 times an article was written about Zika virus. So that might be an indication to us that we might need to pay attention to that. And some of you may be doing math and statistics, but you could automate procedures to actually look at where there's a deviation from expected uh, values at any given time. So you can see visually there's a spike there, but you can actually automate procedures to scan and say something is not happening at the pace that we would normally expect. That's just one, and then every one of these things where it's a Zika virus is hyperlinked. If I click on it, it will actually take me to the original story, and if it's not in English, Google Translate will translate it into English so I can read what it says. So that's how you could just take a lot of this information quickly, gather some of that, that insight. So I'm going to talk a little bit about now this creature. It's uh, the Airline Transportation Network. These are the flight lines that represent how the whole world is connected. It's an interesting map, I think, because you see the underlying physical geography of the world, but it's just lines. So these are all the flight paths of the roughly 3.5 billion people who board commercial flights every single year. Um, and so this is what I've been studying for about eight years or so now. Um, and I, this is where I started to work with um, the airline industry itself. So we actually gather anonymized data on three and a half billion people every year. We have almost 25 billion flight itineraries sitting upstairs um, on our servers. I just to say it's that way, it's in the hospital servers. Um, so lots of information, lots of data. I wouldn't have envisioned 10 years ago that we have tens of billions approaching 100 billion pieces of data, but that's kind of the reality of the world that you're gonna grow up in and the volume and scale of information um, that you will have access to. This is just to show you that we're really mobile. This is how many kilometers we traveled. We actually added up every person's flight itinerary as the crow flies. They call this the great circle distance if for those geographers or budding geographers uh, in the room. And we added up and said, how mobile are we? Turns out we're six trillion kilometers is how far we flew last year. So you guys might be young for air mile programs, but um, this is the time to sign up if you are thinking about uh, traveling. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity here. Six trillion kilometers is 0.6 light years, just to put that in perspective. This is a lot of mobility in this tiny little rock that we are on uh, here uh, on Earth. 20,000 round trips to the sun. So we started using this information back in 2009 when the H1N1 pandemic first appeared in Mexico. And for the first time, we were able to actually see how the wave of this virus would spread so that different places could start to prepare and anticipate. Um, and it actually turned out something we, we published uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine, something that actually uh, aligned very closely with what was being observed. Um, so there's still ongoing work to try and see um, how we can better harness and tap into some of this type of information. But the bigger challenge isn't just about figuring out where something is and where it's going to go. The bigger challenge is figuring out what's the consequence, what's the impact. So we've been working with the U.S. Centers for Disease Control. This was an article in the New York Times that covered some of our work on contextualizing epidemics and infectious diseases. So infectious diseases sounds like one thing, but it's hundreds of different things. Every virus, every parasite, every bacterium is unique. It has a different life cycle. It has different characteristics. So for one, for Zika virus, I need to know about climate. I need to know about mosquitoes. I need to know about demographics. I need to know about travel patterns, precipitation. But for another disease like MERS, I might need to know about camels or bats, for example, something completely different. 
So how do we gather all of this disparate, diverse information and organize it so that it's useful for us? And how do we do it quickly, as I mentioned earlier? The clock is ticking. Um, uh, we don't have six months uh, to decide we're going to get information out. So anticipating impact at a, at a uh, population level, um, this is something we call the infectious disease triangle. So this is really tells us that context is very key when it comes to infections. So a case of cholera, cholera is a, a foodborne, waterborne disease that is spread through contaminated food or water. And if we had a case of cholera in Toronto, we have toilets, we have taps that have clean running water. Cholera isn't going to go anywhere. It just doesn't have the right environment to actually be able to spread. But one case of cholera introduced into Haiti after an earthquake in 2010, completely different situation. So impact is a function not just of the characteristics of the disease, but the vulnerability and susceptibility of the population and the environmental conditions and are they conducive to this type of transmission. And then, do we have countermeasures? Do we have a vaccine? Do we have antibiotics? What could we do to impact that pathogen? So how do we do that? So many different pieces of data, all the different types of various animals and environmental factors. So we need information not just on where diseases are occurring, we need to know where people are settled, we need to know their density, their behaviors, their demographics. We need to know about animals. Many of us don't think about this, that about 75% of every new infectious disease we see in humans comes from animals whether it's SARS, or whether it's Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, or even Ebola, or even HIV, for example. These are all diseases that have come into human populations from animals. So, um, you know, this is something where we have to think going forward about do we sort of live in a bubble, or is our health intertwined with the health of other living systems in our world? And I think that's a very, very important thing for us to keep in mind. So animals and their health. We need to know about insects and entomology and the behavior of the insects. Um, we need to know about climate conditions. Can we draw information from satellites? So in our tools, we are actually gathering 24 hours a day. Every moment that these multiple satellites are orbiting, we're pulling all of their data and populating so we know exactly what's happening at any given point in time. Um, and then how do we know how people are moving? And so this is also, as I mentioned, how we're gathering all these different types of data and organizing them. And essentially, digitizing this information, sort of turning them into ones and zeros, if you will, uh, so that we have immediate access to them in a quick uh, quick way. So now I think I'm going to show another video. Let me see. If, yeah, I am. This one is going to pick up where we left off, saying, okay, well, here's Zika virus in Brazil. I'm just going to show you a few different dimensions of data and how they could be used to do a risk assessment. So now I'm going to actually turn off the surveillance layer, and I'm going to start saying, well, okay, well, I know that Zika virus is present in Brazil. I want to tap into every person who buys a ticket anywhere in the world, and I'm going to look only at the people whose tickets are purchased in Brazil. Could be a domestic airport, could be an international airport, I want to know where they're going. Um, and it's amazing to think that that data is there. If you want to book a flight, you might know that seat 4B is taken, but 4A is not. You know, so, so the industry has actually, because there's a need for it for, for economic purposes, has actually created these databases and, and we've been able to work with them on harnessing them for a different purpose. Now I've tapped into every commercial airport in Brazil and I'm going to turn on the distribution of Aedes aegypti. This is the mosquito that can transmit Zika virus. So now you can see some of the areas in red where the mosquito is most um, uh, densely present. And I'm going to use, for those of you who might be geographers or into geographic information systems, I'm just going to draw a line around those red areas in the southern U.S. I'm just going to draw that line. And then now that's going to pull the underlying geographic information. It's going to highlight the states where um, those mosquitoes happen to be present. And then I'm going to call our database of all these billions of flights. And I'm going to say, well, where are these flights actually turn off the mosquito layer, and now I'm going to say, well, where are these flights coming from? Where are they going to? Now, as I scale back and look at them, we've drawn those flight paths, and we have a table that shows us Sao Paulo to Miami has got a lot of people, and the actual number of seats on every single aircraft when added together. And now I'm going to look at where people are departing from in Brazil. Where are they originating from? Uh, what are the volumes of people? Are they traveling direct? Are they making connecting flights? Where are they going? 
Uh, then I may want to look at the port of entry. Where do they first land when they arrive in the continental US? So Miami and Orlando and Fort Lauderdale and Atlanta are sort of the top one. Um, but then they may make connecting flights domestically. Where are they going to go? So these are all pieces of information that are relevant to a border, uh, someone who's actually looking for health risks at the border, someone who's looking for health risks at the community level, or frontline healthcare providers and hospitals and so on. Um, and this is just zooming in a little bit so we can see this area. Now I'm going to call satellite data because I know that the mosquitoes are present there, but I don't actually know if the temperature is conducive for this mosquito to be able to replicate the virus in its salivary glands. So now I'm going to actually take satellite information and turn that on and say, well, how warm is it there right now? Um, see if I'm doing that. There we go. And now I can draw from satellites from NASA that tell me about temperature or precipitation or humidity. I'll just let it sort of go through and, and show you that, how much rainfall is happening anywhere. Uh, areas in blue are wetter and areas in, in tan are drier. Um, what's the humidity, which is also relevant to the uh, life cycle of the mosquito. And I'm just going to go one step further here. Let's see, I think I've got a minute left here. Maybe I'll jump ahead. So now, as I mentioned, that Zika virus affects uh, the biggest concern is in women who could be pregnant or planning on becoming pregnant. So now we can actually draw from the census data in the United States and actually look specifically at where are there individuals who are women between the ages of 15 and 49, our sort of traditional definition of women who may uh, be of reproductive age, and can we go and actually gather and pull that information. So now I've just highlighted this from the census, and I'm just going to do a quick search, and this is going to draw all of that information, uh, and draw the map dynamically, you can see the ages from 15 to 49, and I think I've just decided I only want to look at the state of Texas, so I'll do that, and at the county level, um, it's going to just create a map for me. Now I'll see, I'm just going to take the legend off there, um, and now you can see in Texas we know exactly which states. 25% of everyone in Harris County is a woman between the age of 15 and 49. And then we can dive deeper and say, well, where were they born? What languages they speak? What kind of education? Would we want to provide to them, and what would we need to do in Spanish or English, and so on. So this is a little bit of a sense of how information can become powerful and can, can help you make decisions in an agile and a timely way uh, for a wide range of different types of questions. Okay, so now I'm going to end up here. Apologize, I'm a little behind, but I will go through this quickly. So I often felt that commercialization and the creation of a company was in conflict with social good, that somehow industry always naively to me felt like, oh, well, industry kind of does, like, it's about making money. And then I was, like, wanting to focus on improving people's health and lives in, in, in different ways. And I always sort of felt like, I don't know if, if these two are in conflict with one another. And I think I eventually came to terms with the fact that there's a role for government, there's a role for academia to create new ideas, but there's a role for industry as well. And academia has its limits as to how far you can take things, how much can you grow them. You can publish a paper, but lo a lot of the time you're expecting someone else to be able to take that information and do something with it. What I was really hoping to do was to say, I don't want to write papers in a time frame that takes six months when the information is needed urgently. Let's actually use technology and information in another vehicle to accelerate the creation and distribution of that knowledge at a global scale, not just locally. Blue Dot was something that is a social enterprise. It's actually a certified B corporation or a social benefit corporation. It's actually created with a specific mandate to address social challenges. I, I suspect many of you do not think a lot about corporate governance, but for those of you who might in the room, the directors of the company are personally responsible to make sure that this company addresses social challenges and is considering the consequences. In a normal company, the directors are responsible for one thing, which is making as much profits for their shareholders as they can. A social benefit corporation considers social metrics as a form of currency. And that was something that I was very excited about as a potential business model to see if we could have more of an impact. 
So a social benefit corporation here has three things. There's a fiduciary or a legal responsibility to have a positive impact on society and the environment. We're actually measured by this. We have people that come in and audit what we're doing to make sure that we're actually staying in line with our mission. Um, and we have to consider non-financial interests when making decisions. And we have the overall social and environmental performance that is measured using uh, third-party standards. Uh, the B Corporation organization came out of the state of Massachusetts, and there are, when we incorporated, there were only about 50 companies in Canada that were B Corporations. That number has grown considerably since. So I'm going to end out by saying, I think what's been exciting for me personally in my own career has been the opportunity for unencumbered discovery as an academic to be just thinking freely about ideas, ideas that the marketplace hasn't said we need a solution and we need a solution and we need to think about what our next quarter looks like. Will we be able to sell that solution? Those are some of the challenges that business faces. But academia gives me a bit more freedom to be looking kind of past the windshield, be looking off into the horizon, thinking about challenges that we might face and how we might want to confront them in the future. I think what the industry side gives, and this is just a, you know, essentially like a big giant iPad, if you will, that we use for some of our maps, is um, how can we use information technology in ways that we, um, uh, we don't uh, always have that opportunity in a strictly academic environment, especially many of us function in more silos, I will say. I hope you do not in your careers. I hope you um, uh, are working much more collaboratively collaboratively in teams because the problems that we're facing and challenges we're facing today cannot be solved by one discipline. <coughs> As a physician, I can't solve, there's nothing I can do to solve this problem. I just have like one perspective on this. But a data scientist has another perspective. A human factors and design person has another perspective. So the team that, uh, that we built, and this is about 35 of us, they're physicians like myself, they're public health analysts, there are statisticians, mathematicians, epidemiologists, an ecologist, we work with entomologists, climate experts, people who work with data and remote sensing like satellites, um, computer engineers and software developers, mobile application developers, you probably all have, uh, or many of you probably have phones and apps and so forth, um, and, and then also someone who's thinking about the social side of the business, how do we actually sustain ourselves, how do we not continually have to go to public funding, but how can we actually sustain and grow ourselves and create new jobs and create an economy that is based on ideas. Um, I'm going to just say this one thing, even though it has nothing to do with my talk directly, but you know, we've seen the dollar recently just go in parallel with the price of a barrel of oil. That really tells us that our economy is heavily, heavily connected to our natural resources. And the question is going forward, is that what we want this country to be? Is it going to be we're going to have to create jobs and wealth by digging holes into the ground or taking out minerals or cutting down forests? Or how can we innovate and create and, and create jobs and wealth and opportunities for us where we're also contributing positively to the world around us, to our environment, to addressing social challenges? So I think, to me, that's been my path of thinking about what a clinician does or a physician does, and then learning that it can be so much more than that. Um, and it may be non-traditional, and there are risks associated with taking these, some of these steps, uh, but there's also opportunities associated with them. So I think I'm going to end here, and that's how we got our name Blue Dot. Um, this pale blue dot is a phrase that Carl Sagan used when referring to the Earth. So um, thank you very much for your time and, and interest and you know I'm happy to take questions or, or comments if, if people have any. So, thank you. You mentioned early on this was an excellent presentation on Thank you. Um, but you mentioned that some of these things um, start in animals and of course we those of us that are not vegetarian totally do eat animals. And um, bird flu is one of the things that we might consume. Um, there's companies that are actually advertising that they do not use antibiotics mm -hmm. and they're proud of them. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be a good thing mm -hmm. to have us eat things that aren't... Or aren't, uh, where antibiotics aren't used for growth? Well, I don't know. It, yeah. 
it so, like it would be a good thing. It, it does, yes. And this is really, I think, where you have competing interests. So just for everyone in the room wondering, well, why do we give antibiotics to livestock? And why would we give them to chickens and cows and so on? Um, it's less that we're treating them for a bacterial infection and more that it can actually help promote growth. Um, and this may be in part because often the conditions in which animals are uh, grown uh, are ex incredibly crowded, densely crowded, where there, again, an infection can quickly wipe out an entire um, uh, you know, a number of animals. Um, and so antibiotics are used to try and promote the growth. And the growth, which is weight, which translates into dollars and cents. So. But wouldn't that be hormones? Uh, there could be hormones as well, but antibiotics in addition. So, um, on one hand, this is this is the trade-off between the societal impacts and the benefits that a corporation or an industry might receive. So, on one hand, the agricultural industry would look at this and say, "This is important. We have seven billion people who are not all vegetarians, and someone's going like, to, you know, you think about it." How are we going to feed 8 billion or 10 billion people? So they're constantly thinking about ways that they can, they can do that. Um, however, the consequence is that it breeds antimicrobial resistance. So then if you come to the hospital and you have an infection here with one of these very resistant organisms, or maybe you don't even come to the hospital. Maybe you have it now in your gastrointestinal tract because of something you just ate that was fed antibiotics. And then maybe someday that actually is no longer just you know, a bystander in your gastrointestinal tract. It actually causes an infection in your bloodstream, for instance. And then how do you treat that in that situation? The other thing is that many of these bacteria are very, very smart. They actually they share with one another genetic material called plasmids where they can actually share with another bacteria the resistance information or gene that they've acquired. And so... This is a very big social and societal challenge with global implications in terms of antimicrobial resistance. Um, that's on the one side, and then on the other side is, do we want our burger, and how many of them do we want? So I'm not going to turn this into an ethical discussion, uh, but it is something that we all have to ask ourselves. We are so disconnected from our food that we don't even know where it's coming from. If, if someone looked at an animal and then decided to eat a hamburger, they might have a different feeling, but we're so disconnected from it. So a lot of these processes, whether it's antibiotics, hormones, are invisible to us, unless we're really looking carefully. Um, so again, I hope I didn't turn that into an ethical, moral discussion, but it is, it is that, and it's an environmental and a health issue as well. Please. Uh, when a large-scale epidemic occurs, uh what do you think uh, the first step should be for a government to ensure the safety of their civilians? Mm -hmm. You know, it's very interesting. That's a great question. You know, so for those of you who didn't hear, when a uh, when there's an epidemic, what should a government do to ensure the safety of its civilians? You know, the longer that I've been in this, I also ask the other question: What can civilians do to ensure the safety of their country, for example? Or how about if we start thinking for a moment beyond just our own national borders? We're global citizens. That's the reality of the world that we live in today. And I think Canadians in particular, I'm just looking at the demographics around this room right here. This room is a microcosm of what the whole world looks like in terms of our demographics. Um, what is our responsibility beyond just our citizens? So I think this actually works in multiple different ways. Government can play a role. And it can play a role in policy decisions. Academia can play a role in ways that government can't. I, I don't want to say something negative about government, but government doesn't really have a culture of innovation and discovery and creativity. You kind of think often about, let's not try and do something too disruptive that might have risks associated with it. It's about stability and so on. So academia has an opportunity to contribute with ideas and innovations. And then industry, I think, has a role as well, as well as civil society or non-governmental organizations. There are many different roles that different segments of society have. I think the answer is it depends on what the epidemic is, but the foundation of it is sharing information. And that is sharing information about risks. This is a very difficult balance, um, and I found in my career between sounding like you're over-sounding the alarm versus 
under sounding the alarm. On one hand, if you say, this is something you need to pay attention to, this is serious, there will be a segment of the population that says, you're fear-mongering and you're creating this because you have some other reasons or interest to do so. And then on the flip side, if you don't say enough and it turns into something, people will say, you weren't prepared and you didn't get us ready for this. So it's a delicate balance. Um, so I'm not going to answer that question directly other than say that every segment of society has a role to play. And it's not just government protecting us, it's what can we do collectively, all of us. Every single one of us owns this problem, and I think every single one of us you know, shares the risks of these problems, and we own these problems, and we have a responsibility collectively to address them. Uh, what's being done to fight uh, the Zika virus? Oh, yeah. Oh, gosh. It's very scary. It is. If women are supposed not to become pregnant, it's impossible. Yeah. It's, so this is a very, very intense area of debate right now. Uh, it is literally, I mean, it's, it's at the White House, and there are discussions there and around the globe as to how we're going to confront this issue. No vaccine, nothing that will be available in the foreseeable future no known effective antiviral ther therapies, um, and it's spread by mosquitoes. It's different than, say, Ebola, which, devastating as it was, how it devastated an entire region of, of uh, West Africa, um, but it's spread by mosquitoes. So this is not going to be contained in three countries. We already see it in 14 right now, and it'll probably go to 20 or 25 or 30. Um, and the only way to address it is through the mosquito itself or avoiding mosquito bites. Very difficult things to do. So I don't have any answers for you. This is a very, very important, very serious event. Uh, it highlights to us again that we live on this tiny little small blue dot that um, we're all in this together, like it or not. Um, and so uh, I don't have any answers for you right now, but I think things like vaccine development would be, acceleration of that development would be very important. Um, but we will have to sort of see how this plays out. I will say that the association with microcephaly and Zika virus infection in pregnant women is compelling, but I wouldn't say yet that it is a 100% certainty, but it's very compelling. And likely, based on some of the conversations, there's likely going to be a travel advisory issued um, in the next 24 to 48 hours um, on this particular virus. Uh, because as you can imagine, if you're a pregnant woman and you're going into these areas, you run that risk that um, this could have very profound implications. And, and you can imagine for the people who live in the area, like what are the social consequences of a change in fertility rates across an entire region of the world? It's pretty, pretty, pretty big. Um, so I don't have an answer for you. More questions than answers at this point. Yes, in the back. So how are vaccines developed and how are they tested on animals? So the vaccines are developed in a number of different ways and it depends on the type of actual organism that you're dealing with. Um, I think that might be, I'm going to probably defer that one in, in deep depth because that's almost an entire hour long presentation um, unto itself. Um, Testing on animals happens uh, because there are various phases that um, we go through in clinical trials to make sure first we, we have the right dose uh, in a vaccine that it's not causing side effects that are dangerous or harmful and then it's gradually introduced into humans and then gradually into larger clinical trials. We saw some of this with the Ebola uh, vaccine that was being developed and in, in, including on some of the intellectual property that was created right here in Canada. Um, so uh, it's a lengthy process. It often takes years, if not decades, to get a vaccine from idea to into a person's arm. Um, you just think about West Nile virus has been here since 1999, that's 16 years. Or HIV, we don't have a vaccine for HIV. So the process is, um, can be complicated. In some situations it's simpler than others. Um, 
but it is not a short process. And the regulatory, we kind of call this going through all the stages to make sure that it's safe at every step of the way, is a very, very cumbersome process. Um, the Ebola vaccine, getting that out as quickly as it was, was unprecedented. I don't think there's any event that uh, was as quick as that. Um, I know that I'm mindful of time. There's another question um, somewhere here I thought I saw in the back. Uh, yes, please. Uh, is, it, is it possible to, uh, to reverse antimicrobial resistance? And mm. if not, if not what would be the way, best way to prevent it from happening? Mm -hmm. So this is, this is a really great question, Goss. I'm sensing an evolutionary biologist in you, but uh, um, I'm going to just say that um, th this has been studied looking at removing antibiotic pressure, and this has to do with um, ecological competition. And what I mean by that is we think about competition, say, you know, in, I don't know, in an ecosystem between animals and insects and how they compete with one another. Bacteria can do the same thing and compete with one another. And the fitness of those bacteria will will indicate which will be the predominant species, what will take over. You almost could think about it like your lawn and weeds. You know, I don't know what your lawn looks like, but I'm losing that battle. I got lots of weeds and not a lot of grass. Um, so that's the same kind of issue. If I started to do something differently, would it impact um, antimicrobial resistance? And I think the, the answer is probably it does in some situations. There have been some studies to show that we can actually some of the more susceptible strains of bacteria are more ecologically fit. They're more competitive in getting rid of some of the other bacteria. This is why some people take probiotics and so on. Um, the second question is how do we stop it? It's really how do, we, you know, organisms and bacteria are quite happy to be living in the state that they have been for millennia, which is they've never seen antimicrobials, so they're quite happy to just stay as they are but it's the pressure that we apply to them with antibiotics that push them in different directions. This is just Darwinian evolution here. We take like a billion bacteria and we hit them with a whole bunch of um, uh, antibiotics. A tiny segment of them will have some sort of characteristics, a survival advantage, which they'll be able to survive, but the others will die off. And when the others die off and then we stop the antibiotics, that small cross-section now multiplies. Now that's now your predominant strain. So antimicrobial use, I think for me personally, it's one of the biggest issues is antimicrobial use in livestock. So our, our options are either don't consume livestock and decrease the pressure on industry, or do this without the use of antibiotics, and then think judiciously, carefully about when you're taking antibiotics. Do you need them? Work with your doctor on making that decision complete the full course of antibiotics if you're given them. Because when you go halfway, you can often breed resistance that becomes the, this full strain. You want to get rid of all 100% of those uh, bacteria that are causing the infection, not 50%. Um, so those are some of the, the considerations around antimicrobial resistance. I think I'll take one last question just with time at the back. Well, I was just, my question is more about just your career and how you um now you're thinking so broadly when you're blending sort of the in that industry with academia. Is that something you've always wanted to do or is it came in a necessity in terms of looking at you know, challenging challenge, challenges that you're facing in, in yeah. your field? Thank you for that question. Gosh, I feel like I need to take a deep breath before I answer that one because it's, uh, it's a long question. I actually never knew that I, I even wanted to go into science. I was very interested in the arts um, and had a lot of reflection about you know, took a year off and thought a lot about what I wanted to do, really enjoyed science and people, um, and kind of found that medicine was a pathway for me to um, feel really excited about getting up in the morning every day, always feeling like what I was, I didn't have to question what I was doing. And, and that's a really, I mean, if that's one message I can pass on to, to all of you um, at this stage of your lives is that you spend a lot of time in your work um, love it. I mean, that's that's the best way to have a, a graceful and enjoyable life. Is um, is really enjoy what you do. Be passionate about it. It gets you out of the bed in the morning. It doesn't feel like work. I actually say to some of my uh, friends and colleagues that you know I feel pretty lucky. I feel like I don't have a job. I just get to come play every day and do something that's exciting, innovative, um, but also is benefiting individuals and hopefully society at the same time. 
Um, the path into industry was a very tough one for me personally, uh, because I'd always had in my mind, now I'll just tell you a little anecdote, someone when I first created the company, uh, a close friend said, hey, I heard you turned to the dark side, and some of you may have seen the new Star Wars movies, you know, so, and uh, I said, oh gosh, like, what do you mean the dark side? And they're like, well, you went into industry. Um, and so that is the way I used to think about industry. I used to think industry was somehow, I don't want to say evil, that's a little too strong, but very self-centered, very focused on profits, not necessarily as much consideration for social impact. I think the wave that we're seeing in industry around the world today is exciting, which is let's think about how business can be a vehicle as a force for good. What kind of social impacts can we have? Can we be both profitable and grow and create jobs and be sustainable and benefit society at the same time? So that was a lot of reflection for me. I'm glad that I did it. Do I know whether this will be successful? Any business, you have a risk. I mean, we're two years old, so we're, we're toddlers still. Um, but you know, we've grown to 35 people. We have uh, investors, clients. You know, we're, we're growing. We're having our impact um, in a lot of different countries around the world. Almost 40 countries we've been engaging with and working with. So, um, so it's a little bit of a, a serendipitous path, one that I hadn't really fully anticipated. 10 years ago, I never would have imagined. This was not by design. This was kind of by accident. And I would say uh, by pragmatism of just saying, there's only so much I can do, and is my career, and, and what am I adding to the world? That's what I often tell my kids. You know, I have three young kids. So, you know, they're like, what should I do this? Should I do this? What, this thing? what are you adding to the world? And, um, and this is an opportunity, I feel like, to make a contribution that's bigger than myself. And that's, I think, a really great way to, to be excited about what you're doing, your careers, um, and, um, and, and so that's kind of just how things have unfolded. Um, somewhat randomly, I would say, for me. I think I'm going to end here. Thank you very much.